Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in the um, IAWF um, lecture series and seminar. Today, we do um, have an amazing panel with us, which we are going to talk about suicide, um, a conversation that is hard for everyone who um, has been facing this matter, whether they experience it themselves, at one point of the thoughts of suicide, um, whether someone has been depressed, whether someone has entertained it, or we have families and friends who um, have been through this ordeal or they have chosen suicide and we are the people who have to live beyond them. So this is a very important topic and we like to uh, shed some light onto it. So thank you for joining us and spending your Saturday with us. So let me introduce myself and uh, my wonderful colleagues. I'm, I'm Dr. Fujian Zain. I'm a psychotherapist, the podcast host, international speaker, um, and author. I have a doctorate in clinical psycho psychology and a licensed marriage and family therapist. I practice online and in my office. I'm the originator of the awareness integration theory and intervention and the um, and launched Fujian app for everyone who has the opportunity to experience self-awareness and life fulfillment. I'm the host of the Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian podcast. I'm a lecturer at California State University, Long Beach, and obtaining a graduate certificate in human behavior topic from Harvard University. I also am excited to have Dr. Marianne Dalili, who is a psychotherapist, a life coach who has consulted clients from around the world. She has a doctorate degree in psychology, a certification in emotionally focused therapy, and the founder of Hand in Hand Counseling Center. She started her private practice over 20 years ago and dedicated to helping families, couples, and individuals who struggle in their relationships or as a result of complex trauma. Recently, Dr. Danili has embraced the social media to explore the intersection of psychology and art and music, including biopsychology, perception, cognition, creativity, motivation, and emotion. She holds the motivational talks and live discussions on Instagram with influential professionals from around the globe who have achieved great success in fields related to music and art and in psychosocial intervention. And I'm excited that Kimia Rezai has also joined us, our panel. She's a consultant in the field of accounting. She's a board member of IAWF and has been a member for the past 12 years. Kimia is joining us to talk about her experience as a family member who has lost two loved ones to suicide. She lost her brother Kabe at age of 42 and 18 years ago, and her cousin, Omid, at age 43, about six years ago, to depression. She would like to talk about her experience and how her and other family members are coping with suicide and how it is affected the surviving members. She would also like to talk about the effects of depression in her family, how the family members need to look for signs of depression. She would like to raise the question of how to help anyone with depression. Thank you so much for, for both of you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to start with giving you a little bit of um, facts. Um, when we look, this is the, these are the statistics from World Health Organization. More than 700,000 people die due to suicide every year globally. In US suicide rates increased by 36% between 2000 and 2021. In Iran, suicide rates increased by 40% in the past decade, 40%. In Europe, rates increased by 14% in the past decade with the highest country, um, highest rate in Luthania, Luthania. For every suicide, there are many more people who attempt suicide. A prior suicide attempt is an important risk factor for suicide in the general population. Suicide is the fourth leading cause of death among the ages of 15 and 29 years old. And 77% of global suicides occur in low and middle income countries. Ingestion of pesticide, hanging, firearms are among the most common methods of suicide globally. 
Um, there is also the factors, uh, risk factors that are uh, stated in most of the research. And the personal factors are previous suicide attempts, history of depression and other mental illnesses, serious illnesses such as chronic pain, criminal legal problems, job financial problems or loss, impulsive aggressive tendencies, substance abuse, current or prior history of adverse childhood experiences, sense of hopelessness and violence, vict violence victimization and or perpetration. And in some of the relationships are bullying, family, loved ones, history of suicide, loss of relationships, and high conflict or violent relationships and social isolation. I like to, uh, there's more about community risk factor and social societal risk factor. But I would like to start asking uh, our wonderful um, panelists for them to start sharing about their experiences. The first question is, um, who suffers? Um, the person who's choosing the suicide or the family and um, or the community. And within that, if we could also talk about some of the factors that you know that, for example, Dr. Dalili, you um, you know work with suicide for so many years. So what are some of the factors that you've seen in um, uh, your complex um, work with uh, psychotherapy, with your clients in your psychotherapy practice? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Zaini, for the nice introduction, and thank you, IAW, for creating such a forum to bring in all of us to talk about this very hard topic for many people, but very sensitive and very important topic about suicide. Um, and welcome, everybody. I'm so happy to be here with you. Well, everybody suffers. Um, suicide for the person who is um, attempting to do, imagine for years, maybe for some of them even, think about suicide, think about fighting, think about surviving, think about surviving. So for the example I can give you is, imagine, I mean, this is an example from a client who survived the suicide, were, were telling me, was telling me that, Imagine a black box and you're in it without any airflow, any window, any door, and you're trapped. You're trapped in that box for, for a while, for a long time. And that is every day. And you get to a place that the pain becomes intolerable and you act on suicide. Basically, um, suicide is a side effect of pain. It is a a permanent solution to a temporary feeling. I say that because it is, it is changeable. If they can pass that phase, it is changeable. That's why we have this conversation. So family, when somebody kills themselves, we talk about that person a lot, but we forget to mention that how much family gets infected gets affected of that loss. They um, feel guilty, they feel shame, they feel uh, fear, fear of what's gonna happen next. Sometimes anger, anger about that person, why did he or she do that? Or anger about themselves. And they have to live with this, these emotions for a long time. Community, well, community in one hand, they might create a stigma about against the mental health, you know, in some communities. Some communities get together and try to find solutions and ways of preventing that, which is a positive thing. So it affects everybody in 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 general. Wonderful, thank you so much. As um, you were sharing, it uh, brought up the conversation that uh, there's also another statistic that uh, women uh, attempt suicide uh, on a much higher rate because uh, also the feeling of uh, powerlessness and hopelessness across the world are much more uh, because of the conditions that women have to go uh, through um, is high. So they attempt uh, suicide much more, however, 
uh, the people who succeed the suicide are actually male. So I'm uh, in the middle. I just th I keep throwing some uh, some facts. Uh, right, and men men does that because in men uh, is biologically more impulsivity, and they have more access to lethal means like uh, firearms, maybe dangerous medication, and they act on it. Yes, more than women. Absolutely. Um, Kimia Rezaei, can you share with us in um, your experience of going through and watching a process of someone going through depression or going through some life transition and, um, and how was your experience watching this or being beside it? Yes, thank you. First of all, thank you, Dr. Zaini, for the introduction. Thank, and I'm so glad to be in this panel with you and uh, Dr. Dalili. And thank you for IWF for inviting me. And I'm, I'm happy to be in this panel. Um, so, yes, listening to the conversation right now, um, your question of who's suffering more at the beginning when it happened to me, um, you know, to my family, my brother committed suicide by hanging himself 18 years ago, which is a very strong message to me. I thought it was more painful for us surviving families and um, because, oh, he's gone, he's gone. And the anger, of course, and then the feeling of being very, uh, um, we saw the signs, However, we try to help him, you know, well-educated, 42-year-old family man, successful in everything. I guess the only thing we try to take him to the doctor, we try to talk him into seeing help, seeking help. The only thing we didn't do was, please don't kill yourself. We did, that's the only thing we didn't say. And that was what was guilty, you know, the guilt that I carried for many years. Mm -hmm. But through a lot, you know, hours and hours of therapy and talking to a lot of people who were survivors of suicide, um, who had gone through it, I realized that that was suicide is a disease and the pain they went through. And I remember like toward the end, one day my brother told me, you don't understand. I feel like I'm fire from waist up. Like, I mean, I'm on fire and I'm in pain. And I'm like, do something about it. You know, it was like, you can do something about it. I guess he couldn't. And if we realize, and that really helped me to forgive my brother and be able to see the signs that, oh yes, he, he was more in pain than we were. And even afterward, life went on for us, but the pain that he suffered before doing that, it was probably so hard because it's not easy to kill yourself. And so when my uh, cousin did it years ago, um, I tried to help his sister to go through the same because she's very angry. She has not forgiven him. Um, and I tried to have so many conversations with her that he, when he did this, he, ha he had a loving wife, a not even a year old, beautiful daughter, and still did that, even though like with Omid, everybody, we were all or on high alert talking about suicide. He was going through medication. He was going through you know, exactly the opposite of my brother. So that's why sometimes I wonder what, how do you help? And that, that is the question I come up with is how do you help a person that is going through such a depression and you see the writings on the wall, but yet you help them, it's still, it may end up to a suicide and you don't literally help them. It still will end the same way. So I guess that is the question that I always will wonder and would like to seek the answer to if it, there is any. You brought up such an amazing conversations and it kept bringing so many things in my head. I, um, I used to work in uh, psych hospitals for many years. So part of my job for almost four years was assisting 
helping people who wanted to um, wanted to choose suicide. And there's a reason I don't call it commit because there is a movement in stop calling it commit because this is not a legal issue. Nobody's created a crime. A person who chooses to end their life is their choice. So um, I had to call, you know, hold them on the phone and until convince them so I could get somebody there to put them in a, you know, an ambulance there or the police there, 911, to take them to the hospital, hold them all the way until they were, you know, kind of stayed in the hospital. And I remember, Kimi, as you said, that uh, at one point, somebody, a, a lady stayed in the hospital for almost three months. Um, and um, the whole team of psychiatrists, psychologists, everybody was helping. And we finally, we were convinced that she was safe. You know, her sister came in, got her in her apartment. We got her cat. Everything was set. She sounded happy for the past week that she was in the hospital. And at this time, I was in um, Northern California. And um, she walked out. She got discharged from the hospital. And she went right on a bridge and uh, threw herself out. And we were all shocked in the sense of when someone really is insisting that this is the end for them, that sometimes we all want to help and we do the best and they still get to have their choice. And if that's the case, we need to honor their choice exactly how you were saying at one point, I have to let go and honor their choice. Another conversation that showed up for me as you were talking, and I love for the two of you also to um, give comments on this conversation is, you know, lately we have a lot of, um, you know, especially in California and many of the states, there was a vote for palliative care and someone at the end of life having the option of completing their life, but their choice. Now, it's interesting that you get a completely a different idea about that because someone who is diagnosed with someone, something that is going to be terminal and we know that they're in pain. Um, it, it like the family comes together and still if the family goes back and forth. There's so many people who, you know, their children still say, I don't want you to go. I don't want you to go. It's my selfishness. I, you know, it's okay if you're in pain, but just hang in there for a little longer. And there are people who say and understand that I get it. I understand that it's time for you to relieve the pain. I think when our younger people or someone like you said, who they have young family, I think as a society or a family member, we're holding them kind of accountable to um, shift and do something from, you know, for their illness and the, this illness is not terminal. So I think part of the difference about how the community, the family and society deals with it is if, if you know, if you think no matter what your, you know, your life is going to be ending. So let's just minimize the suffering or the thought process that no, only with a change of perception, look what you could do. You could be so valuable, you know, you are valuable, but you could be so protective for so many other years and be happy. Um, Dr. Dalili, your co any comments on that? Sure, it's a very good point, uh, Dr. Zaini. And I feel like the first, um, the second example that you're comparing suicide it's the illness, it's the uh, most probably if we uh, help those people with the support, they are going to come out of that stage and the decision is not going to be the same. Um, they are not going to wanting to kill themselves if they pass through that stage versus the other scenario probably they are at the stage of their life that they know that there is no comeback to life in a way. And the quality of life is totally not in their favorable way. So they make this decision with all the consciousness. So in suicidal case, uh, as you just mentioned, there are cases that, you know, we can't read other people's mind and it's, difficult to uh, manage that in Kim Yo Jun's uh, case. But 95% of the time, if we get the enough um, trained eyes, because it's, it's hard to, to know, it's hard to read their perception and their perception on the moment, it is totally different, they feel as I said, trapped, they feel like 
they don't worth living. So if we can um, create that group of su support to make them feel like they are worthy, then they're gonna come back to life. Absolutely. Kenya, Yes, actually, uh, Mariam, you brought up a Mariam, you brought up a very good um, um, point that I remember talking to one of my um, one of the people who has survived mm -hmm. the suicide, and she told me that months before her even thought thinking about suicide, she was in pain. Everything was in chaos. And as soon as she put things into play, a, a peace came to her as if this is the right thing for her to do. And the peace was so amazing that she just wanted to live in that peace. And, and even though she, they, she survived, she said that peace carries her now, that feeling that carries her now. And she has, you know, she has not um attempted again not so that and plus so comparing that to like when I remember when my father was um at the hospital and we he had a choice between living a life that would have been on a wheelchair assistance and he chose to he chose to say okay no let me go and um, he gave us the strength to be able to help him to do that. So there are two different things to me. It's just, that's a choice, I guess, or maybe not. It's a fine line between the two of them. I don't know, but both brought peace to them, I guess. Both, you know, somebody who is committing suicide, that peace that is the pain and suffering is gone. And then the person who is going to know that is, truly at the end of their life and choose to, yeah, let me go in peace. So they're both bringing a peace. And I see a, a parallel between the two. Yeah, I, I can see that. And in the case of suicide, the peace that they feel, that's why uh, we therapists, we are watchful on, uh, and, and we, we are trying to talk about this with, with, um, you know, loved ones around the people who are uh, vulnerable to suicide is when you see that all of a sudden mood changes to calmness, that's a danger zone. It means they've already planned to end that pain. But ultimately, it comes back to them wanting to end the pain. It is not the decision of they don't want to live or they're not thinking about the loved ones. And some people say uh, suicide is selfish, but the people who uh, kill them or try to kill themselves, they say it is selfless because at that moment in their perception, they are thinking that I am a burden for those loved ones tolerating this pain that I can't survive and I can't do anything about it. So they are really trapped. They are really trapped in that pain. So the whole point is how we can, if we have people around us, if we see them depressed, not to be afraid, because one of the things that happen is as um, family, as somebody who is seeing their family member is spiraling down in that depression. It's like helplessness. What can I do? What, what else can I do? You know, um, maybe I'm guiding him or her to go to a therapist and he's not going or what else I can do? So we get fearful. We have our own anxiety. And what do, what do we do mostly? We lecture, we advise, you know, look, you have a beautiful children, you have, you're beautiful, you have a beautiful house, you're, you have a, everything. But for that person in that moment, not being able to connect, that's the key word, engage with all those belongings, it's so painful. 
Mm. It's so painful. And just being there, holding that person's hand and asking questions, tell me what is happening? Take me with you to the place that you are. I don't know what does it look like. Tell me what does it look like. And assuring that person that I am here with you and I'm going to stay with you all along until you pass this phase of your life might be helpful for many. Very much. Um, it also reminds me of... Um... A person that I knew that was going through a lot of suffering around uh, bipolar um, disorder and um, because of the times that they were going, whether deep depression or their manic stage, obviously they would behave a particular way. I think that within the, her own community, her own family, there was a lot of frustration around this. So I recall her... Um, getting to an accident um, and, um, you know, not being able to move and then having to um, take pain medication. And at one point she was at, attempted suicide a couple of times, did not succeed, but she was more in this concept of, I'm just going to figure out how to let go because this is too much suffering. Interesting twist happened that at the time that she was at the hospital, she was diagnosed with cancer, breast cancer. And suddenly the whole family changed their attitude. Now they were caring for her because of the cancer. Interesting. She changed. She mm -hmm. became a survivor of cancer. She would go do everything in order to survive. And I remember we started talking and I said, it's interesting. Three months ago when I spoke with you, you were determined about finding a way where nobody would find you and nobody would stop you and look at you like you're determined to stay alive and kick cancer no matter what to the curb and what changed for you like in in your world the way you were thinking you would have said you know I would assume you said oh, thank god like somebody heard my voice and just made my body want it you know to, to kill itself and she said, I suddenly found out how much I matter to my mom. I, yeah. can't, I can't do that to her. And it was this concept that at the big, at before, although they cared, of course they cared, but they showed their care by their frustration. They showed their care, but come on, do something. What's wrong with you? You know, why can't you get it together? And, you know, just go find a treatment. And this is how they were approaching her. But somehow when the cancer came, it was like, oh, it's not her fault. Well, depression is not somebody's fault. Bipolar is not somebody's fault. Mental illnesses are not somebody's fault. But I think that the stigma that's out there is that we see addiction, we see mental, Ill, you know, mental illness, we see depression, bipolar, all of it with, with a way of like, ugh, there's something wrong. Versus when somebody has, you know, like Parkinson's, dementia, um, uh, cancer, the society is like with compassion and awe. And that I think it has a lot to do with, you know, the community risk factors. And um, those are like lack of first lack of access to healthcare. Some people just don't have the access to going to therapists, psychiatrists and appropriate means. Um, suicide sometimes happens in a cluster in the community. Um, there's a, also this stress of, you know, immigration, um, acculturation toward, toward, you know, where you're trying to, to see. And you see a lot of people who kind of immigrate and they have this like beautiful vision in their mind that, oh my God, if I just leave, it's going to be amazing to the other side. And then they go and they're stripped of everything and having to live in a new way. Community violence, um, historical trauma is childhood that has not been healed. And discrimination can also be community uh, risk factors. And societal risk factors are the stigma that we were talking about associated with help seeking and mental illness. And um, another 
as societal risk is easy access to lethal means of suicide among people who are at risk and unsafe media portrayal of suicide, where there's a lot, as you could probably know if you've had young people, because especially with the age of teens, there's a lot of suicide. There's a lot, um, even on YouTube, in TikTok, you can find a lot of different types of means. So people um, who are um, maybe impulsive, they begin doing this as a fad. And I don't know if you remember or not that they were like, kids were suffocating themselves by hanging themselves in the closet. Um, so that also suddenly becomes a fad in the teenagers that for people who are parents of teens, they have to really, really watch and uh, be careful with the fads that suddenly happens. Um, what are some of the warning signs that we need to watch for? Um, Dr. Delili, if you could share from a therapist's point of view and Kimi Aziz, if you could share from someone who, you know, in the family system has watched some of these things, um, could you share, please? Yeah, when you see, um, well, we talked about there are many different factors to uh, come to, uh, for somebody to, to kill themselves. And suicide could be the main factor. There are other things as well. So if we are sensing that, which now we have this conversation to be more alert, to find and sense uh, and can get that clues from the people who are vulnerable. Um, mood changes, as Kimi Ajun and I talked about it, when a person is sad for a long time and all of a sudden it feels like a relief, that's a sign of the planning to end this pain. Um, when we see somebody withdraw and it's not participating in activities, it's isolating themselves, even if they do. I have people that they say, my loved one used to go to every activity, every party, every everywhere that the person used to go. But when we looked at the clips of the movie of that person, there was that disconnection. Um, she was there, but she was not engaged at all. She was in a corner. She was silent. She was not talking. Even when she was talking, you would see that the numbness, the wall, right? So if you're sensing these kind of things from a person, it can be a signs of they are planning. And um, again, um, have being watchful of not having those late on means and as you mentioned around for these people. Most important thing is um, reaching out and asking the direct question, are you planning to kill yourself? This is a hard question. And many people struggle to ask that. But none of the research has shown that asking that question is encouraging the person to, as a matter of fact, kill, kill themselves. Kill themselves. Um, yes. Um, so yes, Mariam, uh, Mariam John, thank you. That was the, the question that I suffered for many years because I didn't ask my brother, are you going to kill yourself? Even though I could see the writings. Um, so as the two experiences we had in my family, um, it, it brought us together, united us against uh, making sure that depression is not going to creep up to any of our family members. I guess um, we all watch each other. Like my brother lost 40 pounds in three months. Mm -hmm. I mean, the suffering was that bad. Or um, my cousin wrote us this, these dark messages. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, he was in England, but he would send us these dark messages saying he's in a bad, bad place. And we were all trying to like talk to him about it, but you're right. We were talking about it as a, well, you can do something about it, not 
I'm so sorry that there's nothing you can do, but let's see what we can all do together or something like that. So as a family, we have come up with plans. We watch each other very closely. We look for signs of like sudden weight loss or sudden weight gain or not attending gatherings, not um, not being social. Um, you know, there's certain things, but we're not, none of us are experts. We, I guess the love, the care that we all uh, have for each other, hoping that that will help us and guide us to see if anybody's going down that path because we do have it in our um, family. It's part of our genes. We have come um, with grapes about it and especially among our boys. So, or, you know, so it has united us to see and try to be closer, talk about it and be more direct about it. It's very important what you're saying, Kimia Jun, because I heard from a therapist who was dealing with a patient um, who was suicidal and attempted to suicide many times, wasn't successful. And um, he comes to a therapist and says, this time, if you call um, to, to 911 for me, I'm not gonna come back to you. And um, well, they somehow they have this conversation and um, she, he, she agrees to take medication and go through the treatment. But uh, the therapist says that I told the secretary and those people that I got permission from the client to call her all the time and check on her. How are you doing? What are you eating? How, what does your day look like? And when client after a while come back and she was feeling much better, the doctor says, the therapist says, oh, the medication helped. She says, no, what helped was those phone calls. It really helped. I felt like I matter. I'm important for somebody. And what you're saying is that togetherness and even the statistic shows the countries like Spain, Greece, um, Italy, um, those countries that they have the culture of togetherness and collectiveness, they have much less suicidal uh, uh, rate versus the countries that are more individualistic. So this collectivism, especially in a right way, especially in an educated way, as, as you are mentioning, it's, it's the key. Yes. Um, other warning signs are also if people are starting to give away some of their belongings. Um, and you could hear it in their sentences, the way they format the sentences. There's no hope for the future. And uh, they uh, it's uh, they come, they start living for the here and now instead of having anything about that it's in the future. Um, what you were talking about, and I am John, um, again, brought this um, memory for me that with a client who is uh, using a lot of substances, and that's another place that suicide happens a lot is the people who are um, also suffering from the illness of addiction. And no matter how many times they try to um, detox and come and go into recovery process, they relapse. And many times after, you know, relapse after relapse, which they also get kind of isolated from the whole family, the same thing, like the anger of the family is there. I'm not good enough. I can't get out of this illness also takes them to a place of I'm done. You know, I'm just gonna use once and be done with it. And they either OD or OD with something, um, you know, pills or they collect pills and they do all of that. But I remember the same thing that you were saying, Maria, where um, she was she was debating with me. I give me one reason which I couldn't and then nothing that I said. Unfortunately, when you sit with someone who's really, really considering, not manipulating, really considering just positive conversation doesn't work just you know giving him like think this way think that way think this way think that way look at this and look at that it just doesn't work but what works is that love and care and I remember saying to her 
I don't want you to die. And I care for you. And she said, I pay you to care for me. I said, no, you pay me to give you tools. Mm. You pay me in order to cure and give you resources and tools for you to do it. You don't pay me to care, but I care. Mm. And I don't want you to die. And then she started crying. And, you know, she's still alive. She's still alive and kicking. She went back, went back to school and um, she's still going back and forth with a lot of, you know, concept of addiction. But it's the caring that when someone really gets it. And again, it's not that other people don't care, but sometimes our anger and frustration comes forward and doesn't allow the person or the person is not in a place of actually hearing it. So it's making sure that, that they know. Uh, the flip side, I also want to share that the same thing we said at the beginning, if somebody really wants to, you know, uh, let go of their life, they will, no matter how many people are around them. So I don't want anybody who's being with us, listening to us, think that if somebody, if, if they have a family member that who chose to complete their life, it's because their family didn't care. So, you know, I'm, we're not, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that you can keep as a family member, as a friend, as someone out in the society to have compassion for them and for them to know that, you know, how that could, that could be. Um, can, go ahead. Also, Fushan Jun, and piggyback on what you're saying is because long before I go to the psychology school and maybe that was one of the reasons that I went to continue something that I had passion to but the experience of um, dealing with somebody who was suicidal and attempted to kill herself well at the end she wasn't successful but she did and she was um the extended family member and we were getting to see each other more often the issue is when you're looking with untrained, uh, untrained eye, when you're not professional, when you're not in these kind of cat gatherings, you don't know. You're scared. You're a human being. We get scared. I mean, I was personally, when I was seeing her, she was dealing with the depression for a long time. She was talking about the depression, not that she's she was hiding it, but I was like, so feeling overwhelmed that I was like, no, things are going to get better. Look, you know, you have this, you have that, as you were just saying, because I was dealing with my own anxiety. What do, what do you do with that? Imagine if you're a mother and your child, you see the signs and you're thinking, if I ask this question and my child says, yes, I want to kill myself, what do you do? You panic. You died before you want to rescue your child. So it is that anxiety that we have to manage. So when we are dealing with these kind of situations, knowing what I know now, it's better to get help even ourselves if the person is not willing to get help. You get help to manage that anxiety, to, to, to fear. So you know how to be there. Obviously we don't know. Yes. Um, another conversation that I've experienced with people who are in that stage of, you know, contemplating is, uh, is knowing that, and I said this to many of my clients that I, if that's what your choice is, I will always honor you because that's your choice. But it's my choice also to share with you that I love to see you alive and in my life in any form because you matter to me. So the concept of honoring someone with their, their choices, it also helps because they go into this uh, defensive mode and want to prove something. They want to prove to you how much they're in pain. And the same thing we were talking about when someone is elderly and they got a chronic illness, you know, they don't have to, they don't have to prove it to us. They're just mm -hmm. like, Here's the diagnosis. They told me I got six months or a year or so. I don't want to. And I'm look look at all these pills that I'm taking in order to be, you know, not feeling the pain. So they don't have to convince us. However, someone who's younger, um, 
it's almost like they go into a place that they're trying to convince us how much they're in pain. So listening to their pain and hearing it, I think that it helps a lot um, for them to at least be able to share with you what's going on. Kimia, anything you'd like to add to this part? Um, yes, yeah, sometimes it's just wanting wanting to also the proof is to make sure that they um the 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 cause, the reason they think the cause of this pain is, which um <clears throat> with my brother was his son um diagnosed with autism, and I think that was the first blow. And then the love of his life, his wife started having an affair. So that was the second. And to me, the way he wanted her to see him was so that she would suffer too. And, and, and I think, I mean, unfortunately, or fortunately that it didn't happen that way because my mom figured it out. She called the police, even though they were in Pittsburgh, she was able to like get the police there but the police got there. It was too late, but um, I think he really want her, wanted her to suffer and see her and feel the guilt. And I think um, sometimes it's probably that that as well, that it may have a factor. Absolutely. Other factors, as you were saying this, that brought into my mind, and we could see it definitely in the um, 40 percent rise in the last decade in Iran is because of the suffering, especially there was a high level of suicide right after the women's movement and uh, when everybody was 40,000 people almost were taken and put in prison, raped um, and uh, tortured. And uh, you see this also with people who go to military and come back from war. Um, and a lot of there's high level of suicide after they come back um, and wanting to reconnect to the society. So when torture has been done, whether it's through rape or physical torture that has been done, the humiliation of, um, you know, a human being's soul in that way and um, kind of watching human, human beings' atrocity of how what, they, what they're capable of doing to another human being makes a lot of the people hopeless. They experience utter powerlessness at that point, and they experience utter hopelessness and shame. Anyone mm -hmm. who's been belittled, they sh the, the shame has it takes over completely. The utterness of powerlessness and hopelessness takes over, and then you also have to watch for uh, suicide rates to go high because at that time the choice is that, and it's very hard to come back into the society after you've gone through such a trauma. And the inability to come back into the society comes, it's its horrible, but you also come back to the society with a lot of fear because some things that you've experienced from people that you would have never known outside that they're capable of that um, makes you live under the umbrella of fear every single minute. And when you live that way and you live in powerlessness all the time, the pain is so much that you just figure I just need to end this pain. I'm never going to allow another human being to do this to me in order never, ever to allow anybody to do what they did to me. I'm going to take control. And the only thing I have control is to complete this life through myself. I'm not going to allow somebody else to do it. So you can see all the different levels of factors that are there. Is, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's interesting what... Uh about what you're mentioning, because you also mentioned about uh, Lithuania being on the top country, having the highest rate of suicide. And interestingly, I just came back from there 10 days ago, and I recognized that while I was there, and when I researched about it, it's the exact same thing. PTSD from all those wars and history and background, and something else that could be the element that I like to talk about is SAD, which is seasonal affective disorder. When countries like um, Northeastern Europe or Scandinavian, that they don't get exposed to sun few months in a year, you know, that our biological clock is being, um, you know, affected and neurotransmitters like 
um, serotonin decreases, and that's related to depression when we don't have enough serotonin. Melatonin comes down. So, yeah, I mean, it was interesting that Lithuania being on top, also suffering from PTSD, as you just mentioned. So I know that throughout the conversation, we've kind of alluded to that, but I like us to complete with uh, the conversation of how can we help, whether, you know, individually, as a family member, as um, a community of, you know, health community, mental health or physicians, um, how can we help uh, from a community stance? And if each one of you can please share kind of like bullet points. So we kind of end our conversation from, from the concept of hope. I can go first. Um, <clears throat> I think there are a few things that I would like to conclude about our, our conversation today is that first of all, um, suicide is a disease and let's look at it as a disease. Um, suicide is not a taboo. There are times that I open up and say, yeah, my brother committed suicide. And there's so many people that come to me and say, you know, my family member who and who committed suicide, but we're all saying he had an accident. No, let's not, let's end that. It's not a taboo to commit, you know, if somebody has attempted suicide. Um, and also the, the love among the family members, the unity that I think is very important to be uh, aware, to be honest with each other and, you know, come up with what is the family. Hey, our family depression is a taboo. It's real. We know it is there. We all can suffer. I can see myself getting down deep down dep into depression. So let's be honest, if I am feeling weird, let somebody know. And if you see somebody's acting different, reach out. Those are my points. Thank you. Yeah, I guess you two um, said it all, but in just giving one example of a story of an old man who was walking by the beach and sees a little girl who's rescuing starfishes by throwing back them in the water. And the old man says, uh, what are you doing? You can rescue this many starfishes. And she picks one. She throws it back in the water and said, I just did one. I just rescued one. And it touches the old man that he engages with her by picking up the starfishes and throwing in the water. And then the other people join them and they all do that. So these kind of conversations, these kind of forums, if we can have more, if we can um, have more groups, if we can pass the word, if we can educate people, if we see somebody, friend, friend of a friend, don't ignore because of our anxiety, because that happens. Go towards the person who's crying, not opposite way. So. Beautiful, thank you so much. Um, and to complete is, um, I ask, um, you know, all of the healthcare professionals and no matter what to ask, what you were saying is a direct question. And when we hear it, you could just ask the direct question um, and um, face the conversation of, um, yes, our anxiety is going to go high. It's confusing when somebody says, yes, I want to kill myself. And, um, you know, for us to, to lend a hand. Um, even if somebody doesn't have the means to go to, you know, physicians or psychologists, if we're trying to help, we can offer them that there's a, you know, if, if you choose to get help, I will support you. Um, so also hopefully based on all everybody's conversation is the compassion that you get taking away the stigma. Um, and sometimes our anxiety makes this into a bad thing, but it's more like the compassion of, I understand your pain. And I'm here for you. Uh, anything you choose, I'm here for you. And I will support you in any format that you like. And I think that gives the person at least openness where even if they don't answer you right then, even if they don't take your hand right then, but they got it in their heart that you are available for them. And when they're ready, they will take your hand and um, try to support themselves and bring them uh, themselves out of it. Um, we would like to 
kind of conclude our conversation, but to open the floor for question and answer. And uh, you're more than welcome to raise your hand and kind of, you know, hop on and open your video and, and ask the question. Or if you don't like, that's not comfortable for you, you're more than welcome to also write your questions and um, in the chat or in the admin, and then we will definitely um, answer your questions. So right now we have two questions uh, by one, uh, the first one by Elham. When it comes to very negative friends, family members, how do you manage the fine line of being there for someone and not allowing them to negatively affect your own mental health? Great question. Diandra? Well, if the, so assess the situation. Is the negativity comes from the illness of the person wanting to kill themselves. It is that illness to the extent that want to kill themselves is, is deep depression. Or we have a lot of people who are negative, right? And yes, it's hard to be around them. So it's kind of assessing that which one it is. This person wants to live their life with negativity or suffering from illness. Um, I would probably say, um, take it one step at a time, you know, um, just be there. Um, keep the communication going, no matter how I know it's going to be difficult to be with negative people, but keep the communication going, uh, send them an email. I'm just thinking of you. You're in my thoughts, just wanting to send you love, you know, small things and let them feel comfortable and open up and hopefully they open up to you. Yes. And you're right that sometimes people are in the pattern of just negative thinking and negative talking. And there's a concept that you can see if it's detrimental, if it's, uh, you know, a complete hopelessness about the future. But you can also always say, you know, I hate to see you suffer so much. I have a friend who she's every time I talk to her, she's so angry. She's in so much rage. And I listened to her for a little while and I just say, it hurts me to see you so much in pain. I wish you would go and take, you know, just take care of yourself and see a psycho psychologist. Um, or, you know, if not, at least go, you know, look at medical management and take medication because I've known you for so many years in this past five years, you have gotten more and more negative and angry. And I hate you, I hate looking at you suffer. Um, and that kind of changes because you're not telling them that they're bad and wrong or I'm tired of your negativity. You're acknowledging that they are in pain, but and you're acknowledging that they're suffering and maybe there's a way of shifting their perception and you know having it another way. The second question from Adriana, if you try to help them and they refuse the help, do you keep persisting or is that crossing the boundaries? Well, um, help, it can be not necessarily be all the time, depends how we look at the help if that person doesn't want to. But when the person is suffering from that pain and illness and thinking that I am not worthy and I'm burdened, maybe just um, being persistent by sending the love notes as you guys just mentioned, I love you. I'm thinking about you. You're important to me without expecting for that person to respond to you. But just remembering that effects, just remembering that matters, that you're there, letting them know that I'm here for you because you're important to me. And I'm going to be there as long as, um, you know, as long as you want me to be there. Um, and, and I'm not, I'm gonna be walk with you all the way um, because I see you sad and your sadness worries me. So just mentioning the these caring statements for her or him to know that you're there and it, it, it affects them. Thank you, Kimia. Um. To me, I believe that um, if you feel something is right to do, just do it because God forbid if something happens to them, you know you did your best. So 
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think that, a lot, like you guys said, just allowing them to know and they can reach out. And you can always say, I'm always here for you whenever you decide to reach out. So it put, puts the ball in their court. And uh, so that you're not crossing boundaries anymore because you're allowing to know that you're here. And it's true. When they call, be there for them. And so that creates a trust that when they need something, they will, you know, be there for you and all of that. Um, Mary says, how can we make a difference? You are already making a difference by being here and participating in these kind of groups and encouraging people and uh, passing on the words to other people and educating them about this matter. Kimya? And caring, um, I think um, being there for them, just being an ear sometimes, a shoulder, I think that that's pretty much all you can do. Sometimes also, I think that conversations uh, about uh, depression, about suicide um, are important to have from a compassionate place. Sometimes people won't share anything. Um, I remember I was in a, a radio program and it was me and another psych psychiatrist. And it was interesting because I said people have the right to their body and whatever it is that they want to do with their body. And the psychiatrist said, no, we have to take them. We have to send somebody. We have to even by force take him to the hospital and all of that. And um, it was interesting that we had that debate over the air. I got 500 calls after that with people telling me they have stashed pills that they have the right to their body and nobody could take that away from them, that they had the ways that they've created, you know, the different means of killing themselves and that the only reason that they didn't was because they thought somebody cared for them. And I got chills when I heard all of this. It's like, do you know how many people around us secretly are thinking about this and are stashing pills or figuring out means of how they're going to do that? And they are holding by a threat, just a threat of any moment taking that action because they've prepared themselves and nobody around them knows. So sometimes just talking about it Overall, people will come out of the closet because they know it's safe and they will share with you. And sometimes they will ask you for help just because they know that it's okay to talk about this, that there is a duality. There's a part of them that wants to die and there's a part of them that wants, you know, that um, wants to stay alive. When I was, you know, on a suicide watch calls, Every night, you know, people were calling and convincing me that they wanted to kill themselves and they wanted me to stay with them while they killed themselves. And I always say, you know, I want the one who's calling me who still wants to be alive to talk to me. Because if you really wanted to kill yourself, you would have already, you wouldn't be on the phone. So there's this always this duality and there, there's a point that they will go or they would stay. What can, how can you make a difference? By letting people to know, it, to know that it's okay to talk to you about death, that it's okay for them to share. And I think that's the way that we can. I don't have any other questions here. So um, if there is no one else that is having a question, uh, then I want to thank both of you and give you kind of one minute each to close if anything we haven't said that you really want people to know and we haven't shared yet, this is the opportunity to do. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Zaini. Well, I just, um, to those loved ones or people who are thinking about suicide, just telling them that surviving this pain is, is, is in the back foot but fighting is being on the front foot. So think about fighting 
and for the family members, loved ones, just remember that uh, your love really matter. And as you just said, giving that space to them, not taking it yourself because of that anxiety, giving to them to express themselves. It's very important. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I would also like to uh, thank everybody in IWF for giving me the um, opportunity to talk about my experience and being here. And I hope that I was able to shed some light as a family member um, and and um, also wanted to just say um, this is a disease and forgive the family member who has done this because keeping an anger um, with them, it just brings more pain to yourself, letting go and forgiving them and understanding that they were in so much pain that they did the most ultimate and hardest thing to their own body is um, actually going to make it much easier um, to um, accept the fact that it was their choice to end their life. Thank you. And uh, thank you again for all of you who are attending. Um, This is an important conversation. Uh, A recording of this conversation will be available by um, IAWF for all of you to listen again, share it with your friends and family, people who you might think that need to have this information. Um, It was beautiful to have all of you here create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. Thank you.